just the presence of water, and from that advance our hypotheses beyond just saying sulfates and clays equals water. We'll actually figure out the environment in which they formed, and then from that we'll ask if this was the kind of env environment that might have also supported microbial life. That's the way that the mission will work. One more question from JPL. Uh, yes, uh, Gordon Tokumatsu at NBC4 in Los Angeles. Um, uh, scientists and engineers and even journalists sometimes speak in the abstract about uh, the discovery of water and life on Mars. I was wondering if any of you gentlemen can talk about the real implications of this in terms of future ex the space exploration and even indeed the, the future of the Earth. Uh, that's a uh, pretty big question, and it's hard to predict how everybody will react. And certainly, going to Mars, one of the main reasons for going there is to figure out whether or not life ever started there. And the one big implication would be, if in the second place in our solar system that we think life has a possibility, and it actually did start there, my conclusion would be that life life is easy, it's a natural process, and that the universe is just littered with places that have life. And I think that would be a pretty spectacular finding. Is there a follow up? Okay, let's now go to San Francisco, to the Ames Research Center for questions. Ames? Good morning, gents. Wayne Friedman here with ABC7 News in San Francisco. This is really a three-part question for you. So what is your batting average for Mars landings? <laughs> then I'd like you to elaborate on what necessitated the use of the sky crane in this incident. And would this be a method you might consider for a manned landing later on? <laughs> well, I'll start and we probably may help here. Okay. <laughs> See, batting average for land admissions, I don't have off the top of my head, is uh, Earth versus Mars, if you will. Uh, for all the missions we've sent, uh, we're right around 40%, 35 40%. So Mars wins most of the time, uh, which is why this is a tough business. Uh, sky crane, why do we need the sky crane? The airbags for Spirit and Opportunity, now I'm in your territory here, Pete, but know. Uh, you know, we were about uh, the, the mass of Spirit or Opportunity with its landing equipment was just about at the limit of what that airbag design system could handle. This mission was always conceived of being uh, a more capable system, and to be able to do that, uh, more instrumentation is required, and as an example, we have uh, about 75 kilograms worth of instruments and 10 of those instruments, whereas Spirit and Opportunity have about uh, uh, 10 or 15 kilograms, uh, I'm sorry, f uh, five, five instruments and about 10 or 15 kilograms worth total. So that kind of capability moved us out of the airbag arena, and we had to come up with another method of doing this. Uh, Sky Crane made sense because if you put the engines uh, and landing systems underneath it and you want to rove, uh, that becomes a problem. You also don't want to drive around the surface with all that uh, excess weight. So, uh, so those were some of the concepts. We needed a different system because we were really at the maximum of the previous landed systems. Uh, and, and would you repeat your third one for me? Oh, humans, never mind, I got it. Human uh, capabilities. Uh, we are just scratching the surface with MSL at a metric ton. When we talk about humans to the surface, we're talking 10 metric tons and above. The Sky Crane system, while from a technique perspective may have some promise, this system cannot put humans on the surface. We're pretty close to the metric ton capabilities about what we'll get. Could it be a great system for landing supplies, whether it's food or water, medical supplies, things like that, in a pinpoint or high precision fashion? It certainly could be a workhorse like that. But for the human systems themselves, I don't think it's capable. Okay, before we go to the uh, phone lines, uh, we have a number of media, uh, not only on the phone line, but at the centers and various other locations. Uh, I doubt very seriously if we will have the time to get to all of the questions. We'll try to extend for a little while. But please, if uh, we don't get to your question, please call my office or any of the folks at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we will get you folks uh, on the phone as quickly as possible today for any follow-ups. But we'll try to get as many as we can before we have to sign off. So, going to the phone line is Dave Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. 
Dave? Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> Uh, a little difficult here, but that's okay. Uh, just one question, and that is, uh, on Mount Sharp, uh, or within the landing ellipse, wherever you land, uh, what do you anticipate being the maximum um, elevate, maximum uh, degree uh, that MSL will be able to climb, if it climbs at all? The spacecraft is capable of, of climbing uh, up pretty much close to 30 degrees. Uh, uh, it depends on the surface it's on. It does uh, worse in sand than it does on, on rock. Uh, that certainly, uh, there's, there's very few places, very, 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 very few places inside the landing ellipse that have those kind of slopes. Uh, as to Mount Sharp, I'll let uh, John answer. Yeah, I'll just uh, add to that that uh, when uh, when Gale Crater first began to float as a as a viable landing site, I I looked at it and said, you know, how in the world are we going to climb up the mountain? And uh, and so we got a task force uh, set up to look at exactly at that question, and we did a series of simulations with the engineering team, uh, uh, the guys in mobility. Uh, to, to find paths that we could feel very secure and comfortable in would, would get us up to, to where we need to be going. And, uh, and we've got multiple routes up there that keep us on the kinds of slopes uh, well below the margins that uh, limits that Pete was just talking about. So we're, we're excited to get there and explore these routes. And if one doesn't work scientifically, the great thing is we can go down and pick another one. Next caller. It's Kelly Beatty from Sky and Telescope. Kelly? Hey, th hey thanks. Uh, this is a question about Marty, the descent imager. Um, apart from the thumbnails, how long will it be before you get the full-blown, uh, all the high-res back? And how will those images uh, inform your early scientific and uh, 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 movement decisions? Let's see. We, we will play the images back uh, starting from the bottom up and then key segments of the, of the descent. Um, and um, I think it will probably take us a few weeks to get back all of the images at high resolution. Um, uh, uh, I think that's probably about what it will be. Um, I'll, I'll let John decide, uh, talk about how it would inform the roving decision, but I would like to point out that we actually have already tremendous photography coverage of the entire landing ellipse because of high-rise on MRO. And so, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, to, there, is, there is some redundancy between Marty at a distance and, uh, and, and high-rise. Um, I, I think the part that will be most valuable scientifically is are the images that are acquired uh, just a few meters above the surface, 10 meters, uh, 5 meters, because those will give us a perspective of the surface at a level of resolution we will not get from any other instrument, high rise and, and, the, and the science cameras included, just because of the elevation that you get. So what, what they're really going to give us, in addition to the, the, the thrilling movie that I'm, I'm sure it's going to be, is is the context in, in which to place our initial observations, and, and that's something we've never had before. Next, we have Craig Kovalt from Aerospace America. Craig? Next, we have Craig Kovalt Hi, this is uh, Craig Kovalt. Can I ask a question of John Grossinger? Go ahead, Craig. Uh, John, please don't be uh, shy about answering this question. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> but uh, everyone pretty much agreement that the U.S. space program needs needs help, needs a boost. How will a success help the U.S. space program as a whole? <laughs> Jeez, no pressure, Craig. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think we all feel feel this incredible uh, sense of, of pressure on on MSL to, to do something grand and profound, and and my feeling about that is it's going to be what it's going to be. We we have done everything possible uh, to pick the best sites. Uh, this was a process that was led by the community that went on for five or six years. We started with almost 100 candidates. We whittled it down to a final four. We picked one of those that we think is a good mate for our, our instruments uh, on this mission. 
And uh, <clears throat> I think it's going to be thrilling. Personally, I, I just can't imagine being disappointed scientifically. Even if we don't find carbon, uh, even if we don't find, you know, some, some feature that, that somebody might choose to, uh, to, to represent a strong indication that not only was it habitable, but there may have been life there. In ascending Mount Sharp, we're going to go through the major eras in the environmental history of Mars that give us the basis for comparison to our own planet. And if you ask the question about how life got started on Earth, how it evolved on Earth, what were the trigger points that bring us to, to the evolution of animals and eventually humans, you always ask, well, what happened if those events didn't occur? Is there some place that you can compare to where that didn't happen? That's Mars. So even in the case that life was never present on Mars, I, I still see it as an uh, <clears throat> extraordinary opportunity to get a bearing on our own existence on Earth. The next call is from John Mangles from the Cleveland Plain Dealer. John? Yes, hi. This probably is from Michael Meyer, but anyone on the panel could take it. I'm wondering, um, it, it, given what we know about the penetrating depths of cosmic radiation on Mars, um, what's the likelihood uh, that you're going to find complex organics? When in the mission would you begin to do that? And are there any unambiguous biosignatures of life, anything that would compel you to say that you definitely have got uh, ancient life, expect life on Mars, or do you expect you would be more cautious, assuming you found complex organics? Okay. Um yeah, the radiation environment on Mars is pretty severe, and um, so one thing you have to worry about is ultraviolet, but that only goes kind of skin deep. So in terms of preserving organics, it's not a real problem. Uh, what you're really worried about are galactic cosmic rays, and those will penetrate beneath the surface, and you do have a problem with those uh, breaking down uh, complex compounds into simpler ones, and eventually you end up with uh, something that's not recognizable. So the trick is, is what you do is you find a rock surface that's fresh, and that way uh, what is exposed or near the surface that you can reach with a drill has only been exposed for a shorter period of time compared to when the rock was actually formed. So there is some hope of finding uh, complex organic compounds if they're there. Uh, the other part is is that some compounds, as they, quote, get weathered by uh, these, you will end up with something that is an uh, organic compound. It's just that you're not able to decipher what it used to be. But it still tells you that the, that the compound or, or compounds used to be there. Um, I think I'd, I've forgotten the latter part of the question, but... Uh, if you want to repeat that, unless uh, I already answered it. Oh, undisputable biomarker. That is an extremely difficult one. Um, for one thing, uh, the scientific community is, by nature will, in fact, have to dispute any uh, organic compound that's found and argue whether or not it is a biosignature. Um, but the other part is it's, you can get many organic compounds formed naturally. And so the hard part would be not well, finding the organic compound will be difficult, but then trying to decipher whether or not it's from biology or whether or not it's a product of physical chemical processes will be a debate. And we saw a good example of that in the Mars meteorite ALH84001, where we found reduced organic compounds, and then the debate was how were they formed, because you can make organics um, without life. Okay, we're going to take a couple of more questions before we uh, close it out here. We're going to now go to Brian uh, Berkstein. I hope I got that last name right from Techno Technology Review. Brian? Yes, you got it right. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, this question came up a little bit ago about, um, for example, whether you could use this landing method uh, for a manned mission to Mars, and the answer was that you know, for example, that you couldn't, uh, maybe you could use it for supplies, things like that. More broadly, could someone sum up how much of this mission will advance the knowledge that uh, NASA feels we, we have or need to have in order to get people to Mars? I can, what are you talking about, right? I'll talk about Medley. So there's two pieces of this we can address that I think are uh, directly applicable. One of them is scientific, and I'll let Michael talk about that, but I'll talk about a, uh, a, 
uh, a technical issue we have with this, not an issue, but a technical capability we have with this. We have, uh, in partnership with the uh, Human Exploration Organization here at NASA, 